People are used to seeing me anyway. Da 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 da. Gonna get the notification soon. Ah. Ah, there it is. Gotta double check on these. You sound far away. Me? No, uh, no, Matt. Oh. Uh, yeah, that'd probably be decent. Alright, welcome in. Uh, I am here. Peter's here. He's making sure Matt is, uh... Far, far away. It is, yeah, you know, sounding good. Uh, they, they keep moving me farther and farther back in the shop. <laughs> yeah. I promised I showered last night, guys. Hey, it, you know, yeah, that's why. You smell way too clean for us. Oh. Yeah. Well, good All morning, right. everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm, uh, 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 I, hey, Bobby. Let's pull up our. Uh, do I, let's pull up our stuff. Do I need to copy the link for the Amazon into the chat? Uh, you can copy it into the chat. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about it in a second. Yeah. And then you, yeah, you can copy it in the in the in the chat. Um, that'll, that'll be that'll be good. For those of you who are new to the show, we don't always have TikTok on. My phone turns on. Well, or I, do we? I, actually, I don't know about that. I, I, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure that TikTok no. is just permanently open on your phone. That's that's what possible. I mean, uh, uh, usually we spend a couple minutes talking about just general beer news or genus news or things going on at the shop, new beers that we've got, and such on and so forth, um, while people start to load into the chat. And then we so, go to a style of the week and then we talk about some fun topics. What, uh, what do you call a uh, sad strawberry? Uh, Saturday. A blueberry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little blue. <laughs> that is, uh, speaking of blueberry, uh, yesterday we had our uh, Blue with Sour event. Um, actually, that was a great uh, great lead-in. I didn't even mean to do that one. Yeah. Um, we got to talk about no, Pokemon. No, no. We got to play Pokemon. You, you did mean to do it. Take no. Full it, credit. Take. That was the fate of the gods. They were leading me into it. They just knew it was going to happen. Especially Kantu and... Oh, God bless Moon Knight for being out right now. Like, yes. Kantu I, or Kanto? Uh, Kantu. Because Kanto is another sweet Kanto's lead another in. One. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. We have uh, let's get off of that. Uh, we had the event. That was pretty fun. Pokemon was played. Blueberries were consumed and drank and cheesecaked. Uh, There's yeah. still some prep left over from the food, so if you're uh, in the area and want to check it out, we've still got some left over. You can come grab a blueberry sour beer, which is delicious, and some cheesecake and some wraps and all that jazz. Yeah, as long as the cheesecake I know blasts. what I'm doing after the live stream. Yeah. 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 That's it's true. A, Open cheesecake available to us is not the <laughs> not a recipe for long-term <laughs> uh, sustainability. Warren did not put a note on it that says do not eat, so that's yeah. his fault. That's on him. Consume that's, one live stream. Uh, that's on him. Uh, other new news, we got the Valley Cup, which has started, and uh, our submission to the Valley Cup is uh, going to be something we're kind of going over in the topic number one. But in general, uh, Valley Cup is a competition, more of a friendly, let's share, uh, marketing kind of thing between all the Valley breweries that decided to participate, to include us, TT's, Snow Eater, Badass, V-Twin, No Drought, Yaya, and... Uh, you should have just had six. You no, seven. no, there's eight. There's eight. eight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nat 20. Nat 20. Nat 20. Nat 20. Yeah. Well, how can we forget Nat 20? I know. Yeah. So go check all them out and then vote for our beer. You got to actually Me? vote for our beer right at the beginning when you get the card. And then when you go to the other breweries to get their submission, you got to look them dead in the eye and said, and then hand I, it to them. I need your stamp, please. They're like, what? You already voted. And be like, yes, I know. I already know the answer to this. <laughs> I just need, you know, your stamp to turn it in. <laughs> Don't actually do that. We'll get us, uh, get us in trouble. I was yeah. going to say, I, I don't yeah. know if I'm allowed to vote for your beer since I... You are 100% allowed to but vote are, for yeah. a beer. I mean, I'm not going to, but... If if there's a better beer out there, I will vote for it. 100%. If there's yeah. a beer better than ours, I will vote for it. I yeah. don't know if there is yet. Not. I mean, I've had a couple of solid beers that I've tasted so far, but not yet. So far, I've only had the, uh, Snow, Eater. the Snow Eater one, and that was really good. Yeah, There's yeah. definitely a different style of IPA than ours, but uh, so it's yeah. going to be preference, honestly. Well, I They're don't both want you guys well. to win right away. I want, I want a couple, and then I want you guys to win to throw your curveball suggestion, because I know you guys are going to do a weird suggestion for whatever oh, yeah. you win. Yeah. Everyone's got a brew lobster beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think we can yeah. do that. I mean, honestly, we probably could go for oyster slash seafood stout. Yeah. That would be fine. 
Yeah, yeah that's probably within the range. Yeah. Damon would probably veto it. Yeah. It would, but, do, but I, do we if, care? If you win, you get to choose. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. He can't say anything about it. Ha! Comment what our style should be, should be when we win. When we win. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, hello to uh, Hunter Lewis from Wisconsin. Um, and Adam Chumbly. I'm glad to see you're here, even though you're juggling kids. Yeah. I know the feeling. And everybody else that we missed further up. Just the Wisconsin reminded me I need to go to Wisconsin Burger and drop off some sodas. And Adam reminded me I should probably grab one of his beers. For or at least uh, yeah. maybe a beer. Yeah, that's, yeah that'd be a good yeah. start. <laughs> So yeah, uh, Valley Cup, that should be pretty fun. There's uh, eight breweries competing in session beers. Uh, and uh, we're, you know, we did, we did a nice locale IPA for that. We, we had a couple of other delicious ones. That's gonna be a great time. I played, a, um, I played Battleship with this beer and it cheated, I think. Yeah. No, it didn't, yeah, it, it was, was a, a fair beer. beer. See Adam, see what we see did there? there. Yeah. Uh, 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 for those of you that can't read, Adam Chumbly sent us this beer and it's a uh, fair beer. So it didn't cheat in Battleship. It didn't cheat. Um, one more thing of news, we kind of branched off media stuff that we do in terms of, so we're still making videos on Genus Brewing. We're gonna try to get some new videos out on Genus Not Brewing. And how that ties in is if you know anybody that needs a video made, we've got people to do it and would like to do that and trade for things and or, and or favors. So uh, um, how uh. that affects Genus Brewing the brewery is we made an Amazon wish list and instead of, or in lieu of a super chat, if you would like to instead buy us a gift from our Amazon wish list, they range in price from like, you know, batteries always up all the way up to ridiculous stuff. We nah. will thank you back in terms of a shout out, a dedicated video to a topic you want us to address. Um, Kind of all the way up. Depends on just. I mean, just if you ask buy us. something really cool and uh, buy all the equipment from us, we'll come to your place and uh, build you uh, a, a draft system. Yeah, and brew it yeah. for you, yeah. with you, yeah. on, on top of. On top you. of you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, check out yeah. check out the wish list if you want to check that out. Uh, if you see something that you're like, I want these guys to have that, then go ahead and buy it, and then we will thank you in whatever way you think is appropriate. Yeah. I shouldn't have said that. It's not that broad. <laughs> it's no. a, I, yeah, I mean, it's not I that mean, broad. <laughs> I mean, I uh, mean, Adam, no, this is not the raspberry version. Uh, no, it's not. I think we drank all the raspberry versions. No, we're getting, I, some, we're getting some good out there. Yeah, it uh, is. This is the raspberry version. No, it's the it raspberry version. Yeah. Like, dang it, man. As soon as I tasted it, I was like, yes, this is the raspberry version. Uh, you tasted. can smell it right off the top too. Yeah. Uh, we're getting a good evening from Belgium over uh, Ooh, Michael we got a hug from Brazil too. Wow. Yeah. Uh, All over I, the world. I'm going to say the, uh, for the fellow in Belgium, please send us every single beer that you can get yourselves your hands on. Yeah. Or just send us the whole breweries. And maybe like as much Scarbeck cherries as you can. I am obsessed with those things. We can't get them here. And if, you know, there's a live seed that just happens to be planted somewhere, <laughs> I will not, not tell we do know anybody. people that are professional growers of things so yeah. we, the, we can make it happen we can make it happen we, i mean uh we do actually i mean we know the guy uh, from pair up and he has tons and tons of pear farms mm -hmm. or pear trees and I'm sure that guy down there could get into the cherry business yeah. anyway i digress uh also nocturnal brewer is on the amazon nice list already because he 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 saw Tim's edition. Ah, <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. No, actually, that. Now, let me talk about that. That was my newest edition on there, which I'm sure uh, he's talking about. Uh, Nocturnal Brewer saw something on there. No, for real. We ride scooters as a primary form of transportation. We both live about two miles away. It saves yep. a lot on gas. We deliver beer on scooters, actually. Yep. Uh, saves on gas. Eases a little bit of traffic that's not existing out here in Spokane Valley. Um and at the same time, like very practical the other day, you know, my car, uh, it didn't necessarily break down, but the check engine light went on and it was making a funny noise. So I was without a proper transportation for a couple of days, but in came the scooty that was amazing. So, wow, that is going to be fun, especially the off road version. <laughs> it is also practical and will get beer to people. Everything I on that list is practical to some extent. I promise issue. Uh, uh, you know, it'll at least be used by the media channel in some way that will be absolutely entertaining. Yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of practical favors that people can do for us, um, if anyone wants to start out by buying us some coffee and breakfast, 
One, uh, of, one of us and only one of us is hungover. Yeah, yeah, exactly one. You guess which. Uh, <laughs> just Uber it right here to the uh, shop. Uh, I'm a I, fan I, of biscuits and gravy. Peter's a fan of uh, country fried steak. I will take a bagel of any sort. Uh, I was gonna say I, I biscuits and gravy for 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 the for, for the, the for our Ned. Man, uh, unless you have like a trezo biscuits and gravy, and then oh my god! Yes. I'm posting. I'm reposting the address into the chat. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do that, we will make a dedicated video about anything you like. Let's get on to our beer of the week. Bump up a beer of the week. Bum, 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 beer beer of the week. week. Yeah. So we're talking about uh, kind of a specialty IPA subcategory, which is session IPAs. Um, and then when you get into our topic number one, we're going to broaden that out to all session beers, talking how to make them flavorful. The specialty IPA that we are going to niche down into today is actually the one that we have on tap as our Valley Cup submission. It is a locale IPA. Yeah. Uh, session IPA, locale IPA, uh, brute uh ish if you want to go there normally brutes will be a little bit more alcoholic and a little more a bit more pungent but mm -hmm. that's actually a lot of the techniques that we're going to use to make this locale and sessionable on that yeah now you might be thinking wow guys bitterness and no body because you're making it brute how's that gonna work awesome i don't know we just, yeah, we just, we mean, just figured it out we, we we did just figure it out i'm gonna throw another couple of shout outs here because you know beer shout outs and actually a wine shout out we Ooh. have somebody also it, oliver hurled thank you so much for the super chat he brewed an ode brewing in january of 2022 uh, fermented it with Safello five and added rosalaire and funk weapon to and suburban brett when should i bottle it uh january 2025 20, yeah you Four. can probably bottle it you could probably bottle it any time between six months and a year. Yeah. Uh, I'd probably go six months, but, but you don't drink any of those bottles until the year mark. And then every year down the road, um, open a bottle until it's perfect. Yeah. It's probably going to be at three or four years until it's perfect. Rosalaire, in my opinion, uh, especially if you're, it's your first pitch and you're not doing a Solara <laughs> with it, it takes a couple years to get perfect, but once it does, Rosalaire is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite blends, uh, especially for Solara. It just works so beautifully. Yeah. Uh, but in my opinion, it at least takes a year to really start developing. Two to three, it's really going to start hitting its stride. You don't have to leave it in a barrel or ferment or whatever that long. Like Peter said, you can actually bottle it pretty in pretty some sturdy soon. bottles. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Cantillon actually puts a lot of their uh, beer in bottles in old uh, bomb shelters underneath mm -hmm. Brussels. That's really cool. I want one of those like bomb like, shelters. Yes, <laughs> uh, full of Cantillon. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's a given. That's a given. But one of the like five foot tall bottles. Yes. So bad. So bad. Uh, okay. If those... Somebody can send us that. We will come shoot a commercial for you, start a business for you, and we will we will marry you i will uh personally make you any meal you want but i'm also going to push for video just because uh, i enjoy it and like to make it yeah, and he's been obsessed with it for the last several years mm. several days i at least a couple of months but that's only because of the taco truck that <laughs> he's like a couple blocks away makes some of the best sorry specialty IPA. well we are making some shout outs there's a guy in uh, argentina down there i really want him to send me some wine um, because Argentinian wine is phenomenal. Some Tempranillo, please. I love Tempranillo. There's a guy in Astoria, and he just needs to send us Fort George, the entire brewery. Yes, that's I, a good point. The entire brewery. Yeah. Please. That's a, is that going to be ground, or can we do one day air on that? Uh, I, you know, I don't even care. But <laughs> either way, send it brick by brick. I don't <laughs> care. Just please, all of it in my mouth. For anybody that hasn't had Fort George uh, Brewing Company, go seek it out. They're amazing. Yeah, and relatively affordable at all style ranges. Oh, God, yes. Oh, man. <laughs> Oliver Horrell. Wow, okay, so that project takes even longer. Thanks a lot. Uh, anytime, <laughs> Oliver. We appreciate yeah. you super chatting us. <laughs> dude, dude. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, Oliver, in that, too, mix firms are really awesome. Uh, they do continue to develop, so... When it starts tasting good, bottle it. But do keep in mind, you threw a ton of Brett in there, and that Brett is going to continue to work on things and create CO2 and carbonation. So really make sure that you're uh, hitting your sugar levels right, uh, your gravity levels right, so you don't blow up bottles because Brett will will create gu uh, gushers. Also, also, Oliver, send us a bottle. Yes. Yeah, also, 
also obligatory send us beer send us beer and, um, and label it matthew that's probably a smart idea for yeah. live stream <laughs> for live stream okay um, uh specialty ib all right i was gonna add just below 1006 is usually a good safe bet when yeah. you're bottling anything with a uh, mixed culture in it uh specialty ipa so we're talking about uh specifically we're going to niche this down into our locale ipas but let's give you the broad rundown of category 21b oh wow i am sorry I just started reading this thing and it just hurt my heart a little bit, but it's also kind of fun. This category allows expansion, <laughs> potential future IPAs. St. Patrick's Day Green IPA. Okay. Better than green. Just crap think, beer. think of it like matcha and spirulina IPA. Yeah, Romulan Blue IPA. That's great. This one hurt my heart. Zima, <laughs> Zima Clear IPA. And if somebody makes a good tasting clear IPA, please do send it to us. I want to try that. Actually, that's possible. Turt blends in a seltzer. Yeah. Uh, how do you add some bot and with monk fruit? Monk fruit. Yeah. I was going to say, it. It, Tim, you're, you're going to be brewing that at some point in time. All right. Look for the Gina Sema clear IPA <laughs> at some point now. All right. <laughs> it's doable. All right. All right. I will add that to the wish Tim's wish list. To, yes. Do it. Do it. Do it. Ah. <laughs> uh, so yeah. this is a broad category. It goes into all sorts of specialty IPAs. Uh, um, specifically, we're going to be niching down again into the session styles. Um, so specialty IPAs is every category of IPA and kind of started yeah. when black IPAs weren't really known how to categorize and red IPAs and white IPAs and uh, Belgian IPAs, uh, now session IPA. All that is now under this category, brute IPAs. There's a lot of them. Um, but the yeah. term IPA is used as a singular descriptor of a type of hoppy bitter i'm gonna put that part in quotes it is not meant mm. to be spelled out as india pale ale when used in context of specialty ipa none of these beers ever historically went to india at least they they mentioned that that's actually yeah a, yeah it's a really cool story and people need to keep perpetuating it because it's much cooler than the actual truth and as far as yeah. i know the truth mm. that we can find in tax histories is some dude in uh basically england figured out that the sailors coming back like a hoppier beer so he called it india styled pale ale yeah. and then sold the shit out of it because if you can sell more with a gimmick that's what we do but now we're calling it's ipa like, a word which yeah. is nice um because then i mean because people also like get on the black ipa part thing too like oh black i and, mean black and pale. i get it i get on that a little bit because it's kind of stupid because it's a black india pale ale instead of saying like ira i love the ira the india red ale that yeah that's a cooler way to say the it. india black ale cascadian dark when we were calling it that that was kind of fun i mean really making a distinction between them besides like here's a color and hops because we put ipa on it but yeah. that's how it's being described now yeah well, IPA it's because is an the, the rest of the because most of these are coming out of the inland northwest slash pacific northwest and the rest of the country is just like they just like their ipas that's all they yeah well now when we got, you're in the, the home of the hops you got to make yeah. ipa but now it's a word on that so it's no longer means india pale ale ipa is just a designation for highly hopped beers um and uh the samba 37 Yes, Cascadian Dark Ale, Floater Joe, yes. IPL, yes, it's greater than cold IPA. When we're talking about the session category of IPA specifically, what we're talking about is any IPA that is under, we'll call it 5.5%, really anything under the normal style for an American style IPA. Uh, usually you want session IPAs to be in that under five, maybe 4.5% range. Uh, then, it's actually under five, it's two five. It's two five? Yeah, it's three to five is where they class. Three to five? Okay. okay. That, that is actually one thing. So that's something I'll that's give, I still it's give official. Point, point, wiggle room. Yeah. yeah, I have seen the market, and personally, I don't enjoy it. Um, but I've seen the market creep higher on session beers, especially for IPAs. As a normal IPA is moving closer to like 7% mm -hmm. instead of that being a double IPA. 5.5 people are calling them session beers now uh, personally i don't enjoy that as much because that's not, for me that's not as sessionable no. if i have a five percent or a four nine beer i can just drink a lot of that if i have a five and a half percent beer it i can't drink as much no and when i hear session i want to chug it i want to be able to drink a lot yeah a volume, not a necessarily volume. of alcohol, but a yeah, lot of volume. Yeah, a lot of like, volume in there. That is a beer, uh, to me, a, a session beer is something that you shouldn't even be worried about the alcohol in it. You should be able to go to a party at 6 p.m., even though you showed up early, it's not super awkward because you're drinking, and then leave at 1 a.m. and not be super plastered. Exactly. And I don't think 5.5, five, I think 5.5 five is a little much. And that's going to get you there, but yeah. But 
you, you're seeing it happen. You're seeing it happen. So I'll include it in that. Yeah. All right. Uh, mm. Getting on that. It, for me, it's five and below. I mean, that's that's where I'm at. Uh, Adam Tommy says this beer was brewed about 10 months ago. It's still good. I was going to say that we, we, we have a... Adam, I'm going to be honest. There's a little box in the beer fridge that's just your beers. <laughs> I've organized it so you, your, your beers have a... Matt's going to be our beer fridge organizer from now on. Yeah, exactly. And we'll do better jobs at drinking. Uh, no. Overall impression, recognizable as an IPA by Balance, Hot Forward, Bitter to Dry, yada, yada, yada. It's uh, overall impression, yeah. it's a beer that's hoppier than other beers. Uh, and that goes, I, I count that by amount of hops, not by um, like IBUs. Because I think you can have a close to zero IBU beer if it's done right, if it represents hops. Especially if you use something like terpenes to get all those big flavors yeah, you know something like hazy ipas or new england's they're known for having extremely low idu but extremely high hoppiness uh, i will say for myself ibu does not equate hoppiness to me in any way shape or form yeah. uh as well as bitterness bitterness is not hoppiness that's a different distinct flavor and i think actually uh as home brewers as beer consumers that's something that we should make a bigger distinction on uh, hoppiness to bitterness. Hoppiness is flavor derived from hops. Bitterness is like, oh shit, that's bitter. Yeah, that's it. you can have a you can have a ten to or you can have a sorry twenty to thirty IBU beer that's made with, uh, you know, made with eight ounces of hops or made with a half ounce of hops. Yeah, and one of them is going to be clearly hoppier than the other one, and it's going to be the one that's made with eight ounces of hops. So. Yeah. That's, how, that's how we think of it. Uh, any of the IPAs, that are, how we're going to categorize them is if it's made with that higher hopped amount, which for mm -hmm. us is probably somewhere between that five and above ounces of hops, depending on a lot of other stuff. Um, that's a Jimmy J. We're going to come back to that question after we get through this, because that's a really cool question. <clears throat> yes. Um, and it, it, it has to do with some confusion in uh, nomenclature. Yes. Uh, all right. So, uh, what we, we, where were we actually on? Uh, we're, we're on appearance. Uh, we can kind of just riff on. Uh, we can just imagine, imagine. Yeah. our locale IPA being all this. Or so this. appearance. Yeah. Uh, for our locale IPA, appearance is just the, it's like a hazy, hazy IPA. Hazy IPA. Yeah. And uh, appearance on this, especially for the session IPA, that's an open, open, open realm. You can have a session that's a Cascadian dark. You can have an IPL session. Uh, it yeah. can be. Golden. You could probably do a session locale Cascadian dark air. That's that's an idea. Yeah, that, I mean, it honestly doesn't sound too bad. I think yeah, it, it would be a lot more, more like a like you, Schwarz IPA. Yeah, it'd be harder to get it into that full flavor realm. But yeah, it's yeah. doable. If you wanted to go like especially the hazy route or the juicier flavor realm route with it. That could be. That, well, no. There's but ways what to if do we it. did it with uh, four, eight, sevens, and uh, it's like some sabro and stuff, and made it super. Oh, there we go. Coconutty. Yeah, and then the monk fruit kind of elevates that coconut. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. Uh, so uh, the appearance on that that can go everywhere. Normally, when you're seeing session IPAs, they are generally a little bit lighter, or in the uh, I would say kind of like five to lower SRM. I'm equating five in there because. I know that people are throwing crystal malt into them because I drank one two days ago. Um, and I don't, I, this might actually not be a bad time to use like C15 or C10. Yeah, or caramel pills. Like we caramel have in our video. That's kind, of our, that's kind of our inch. If you want to inch into the crystal malt world, the only thing that I can see like an, uh, a standard crystal malt, like a C40 to C30 or C40 to C60 oh, range would mm -hmm. be if you were doing a CDA session IPA right, so um, yeah. to try to build some of that body and sweetness to just make it more full. Um, but for any light style IPAs, honestly, just crystal malt shouldn't be in there. And if you're creeping into that world with the session IPA, because it's such a low body already, something like caramel pills is actually a really good malt to kind of add to both puff up the beer because it has some dextrin qualities and offer a small amount of honey like sweetness. It's also going to add, uh, if you're using the German variety, Best Malts is what we use. It has a wonderful little German biscuitiness to it mm -hmm. that gives you some great aromatics in there. Uh, definitely use that for color instead of any uh, crystals. That is a great, great malt for it. Uh, a little bit of chick could probably also be nice. Yeah. But generally, I would say that you're probably going to find in Session IPAs, these are going to be lighter beers. Yeah. Daniel, 50% uh, light Munich in a Session IPA. It's actually not a terrible idea considering mm -hmm. the, the low overall body. You'd want to structure your hops in a way that probably moves it slightly away from the juicy quality of hops and a little bit more towards the dank, maybe a little bit of citrus aggression. Um, just because or that spicy. Munich, or spicy hops, yeah. Because that, that Munich is going to give you that bready, toasty base, and that can sometimes clash with... Uh, um, 
Actually, with juicy hops. That could be really good with more of a kind of, uh, I would say, a German session IPA, some Mandrina Bavaria, throw yeah. it in there. Uh, throw something maybe even with a white wine quality like Nelson Savon. Or yeah. some, Immediately uh, puts my some, brain into like the IPL, like what I kind of hop an IPL in. Yeah. But you can get by with like a, a touch of, you know, Columbus or something. So, oh, Columbus yeah. would be Sativa, amazing. maybe. Sativa would be really good. Actually, and I'm going to throw this out there too, uh, Evergreen. Uh, blend mm-hmm. or Sequoia blend would also be amazing in those. Uh, so yeah, 100% do it. Aroma. Now being an IPA, the aroma on this should be packed full of hoppy goodness. Whatever hop you uh, hop profile you decide to go with, yeah. whether that be fruity, juicy, make it tropical. Joe, thirsty. Yeah. I, wait, I got you. You got me. What do you Ooh, want? A beer for yeah. the bitch? Yeah, I was gonna get a beer. I was gonna get my own beer that way. I didn't have to be. I was saying. You're, I was saying you're making yeah. Floater Joe thirsty. Yeah, you're making uh, Floater Joe thirsty. But I was Joe also gonna get a beer at the same time. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, sorry, we got. I don't even have to derailed. leave. There were some questions there. Obviously, it should be packed with the hop aroma. Whichever hops you're choosing on that, they should be fresh. Uh, they shouldn't be oxidized at all. It shouldn't be cardboardy. What? Uh, shouldn't be cardboardy totally at all. all. And then uh, if. You are doing a darker colored in there, doing you know a red or a black uh, IPA. You should be getting some of the malts coming out of that. You should have a small presence of the malts coming out of it, uh, as well as if you're doing a white or a uh, Belgian IPA, you should be getting yeast-derived esters coming out of that as well. They shouldn't be dominant over the hops. It should be hop dominant. It's an IPA. The aroma is hop dominant. Ah. Hop dominant. Hop dominant. Flavor. Kind of the same iteration right there on flavor, but flavor is going to be a little bit tricky with session uh, IPAs and locale IPAs. Um, yeah, it looks like classic West Coasty. Yeah. Uh, Bottle condition. So. Flavor is going to be tricky because you don't have a lot of support behind the beer. There isn't a lot of sugar. There isn't a lot of malts. There isn't a lot of residual sugar, especially in a locale IPA, to support all of the big hopping rates that you're going to do. So you do actually have to pick some of your malts very specifically to get this. Um, Honestly, when we make a lot of ours, you're going to hear it. Halcyon is one of our malts of choice it does leave some good extra residual sweetness in there that is going to help body boost Uh, we also use some other adjuncts to uh, be able to help that Uh, oats wheat depending on what you're doing i actually do like to use rice as well because that's not adding flavor but it's adding that kind of puffy sweetness in there Um, and then back sweetening for it back sweetening uh for a session or locale uh, IPA is pretty big because you'll find, especially in locale, when you ferment all the sugars out, it's so thin, you're getting an overly, overly bitter beer. There might be some really good hoppy flavors, but it'll be overly bitter. So we got to come back and boost that body back up. Yeah. And we like uh, for locale specifically, um, we like monk fruit extract, uh, monk fruit sugar extract, because it is kind of like stevia and that it's non-fermentable, but it also comes from a natural fruit source, and that fruit is a grainier um, kind of texture, so it actually adds a little bit of pseudo beer flavor. We stole that idea from Dogfish Head, uh, yeah. but once we tried it, we loved it, and we keep using it. Slightly mighty? Yeah. Slightly yeah, mi- uh, slightly mighty. Is it my, yeah, I think it's slightly mighty. Is that Dogfish Head or is that Firestone? No, Firestone is uh, low and go or something like that. Yeah, slightly yeah. mighty. Um, and 100% it works. Using all the other things, you got to use an unfermentable sugar somehow to do that. Personally, I hate all of the uh, diet fake sugars, uh, you know, aspartame, sucralose, all of that. Yeah, uh, even stevia can get a little bit bleh. It, it tastes fake. It just tastes fake. And monk fruit, it tastes like a fruity brown sugar. Uh, generally, I mean, you can taste it's not brown sugar. It's a little bit different than sugar, but it's like a fruity brown sugar. That's pretty much how it translates. It's one to one to uh, towards a white sugar, so it's very easy to use to back sweeten on that. Plus, when you're making a low cal, you do got to think about keeping it in a healthy range, so it does st- uh, keep it in keto and all of uh, the healthy range, the healthy friendly stuff. Yeah. So. 
that is something, I mean, not super duper important for if you don't care, but that is something if you're making a locale to think about that some people might actually be wanting to stay in keto and you can make a keto beer. Yeah. Um, mouthfeel. Mouthfeel. Um, so smooth to me, I mean, this is especially on the session and the mouthfeel is going to range quite widely. Um, so when we're doing our low, uh, low cal IPA, the mouthfeel actually does perceive full again because of that monk fruit sugar, but also we try to select malts that are going to leave some little bits behind um, so that it's not just drying out base two row basically. Um, so it will have some mouthfeel. A lot of that comes from the added back sugar, but uh, because we are bruting that beer completely down, the mouthfeel is going to air on the, on the lighter side. Um, and some su smooth warming notes can happen is what this says. That's more for the higher alcohol versions, um, mm -hmm. not for session IPAs. Uh, realistically, the alcohol should be for a low-cal IPA kind of in um, blend with uh, the hop uh, oils. So any um, hop dankness or hop uh, resinousness should kind of blend in smoothly with the alcohol. Yeah. Um, and the mouthfeel is very important, especially when you're getting such a small beer on there. That's something you really have to think about. To make it more enjoyable, you kind of got to boost the mouthfeel. Like Peter said, the easiest way that we have found is through selective malts on there, plus your selective sugars. Some sugars feel more full than other when you're back sweetening on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's just something to also think about. You could, depending on what style you're doing, also switch over to uh, different yeast that produce bigger, fuller mouthfeels. We like to use Lutra and go very fast and quick. Uh, actually, most quikes. We like to use most quikes. Lutra is one of them. Hornadol, uh, Voss, all of it. They add some extra really good flavors. But instead of doing that, doing something like French Saison on a cold ferment there to get those big, long chain uh, glycerins. Glycerins. Yeah. They're going to make the make it more full. And esters produce a little bit of a body and mouthfeel too. So you feel esters on your tongue as well, not to the same extent as something like a glycerin that can be produced through fermentation. But uh, you can feel any of those ester producing uh, yeasts. So Yeah. Um, so that's something else that you can also think about doing uh, to produce more mouthfeel in here. Melisandre, so. hi guys. Happy to share my Sunday fun day with you. We're happy that you're here too. Ooh, Diego Mendez says... Uh, Diego. Mm, that's also a sexy name. Uh, Verdant yeast sounds nice on a session IPA. And yes, 100%. Uh, Verdant would be really good for that, especially with how much uh, haze and stuff that produces. That's going to be a really good, um, good yeast ease for that. So Yeah. Um, all right. I think we're caught up on questions. And we're pretty much done with breaking down... Uh, our locale style IPA. So let's go on to just in general how to make session beer taste good. And we've kind of touched on some certain things with it, but uh, we'll, we'll dive a little deeper. Let's get a couple of questions in here. There are some uh, really good ones. I saw Jimmy's. You came up here. Uh, random question doesn't pertain. Uh, why in a v in an all Vienna malt beer nearly half the SRM of Vienna lager? He's asking why if you're making a Vienna lager but you use 100% Vienna malt, it doesn't make the same color as a Vienna lager, because those are two in the diff independent things. A Vienna a Vienna lager is a lager typical coming out of Vienna, Austria. Vienna malt is something a little bit different. Well, yes, it's typical of a uh, malt that came out of Vienna, Aust uh, Austria. It's not quite the same thing. Most Vienna lagers actually have a bigger proportion of Munich malt in them than Vienna malt, which doesn't kind of make sense, but at the same time, it does. Yeah. Um, they also rely a little bit on technique, and the SRM is measured a little bit differently. Uh, so yeah. the SRM is measured differently in beer than it is in malts. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, if you use an American Vienna malt, you'd probably get pretty close. Yeah. Um, but if you use a German Vienna malt, those are basically like pale ales with biscuitiness instead that's of sweetness. Right. Uh, and also going into some of the things that that's a very traditional <clears throat> style that was invented before we had a lot of standardized malting practices and measuring practices. Uh, so the malts that uh, were being used to produce uh, old school Vienna lagers probably were very much different than the malts that they are today, just through advances in techniques and practices, standardizations, uh, and techniques and practices in brewing. Um, I would be willing to guarantee that the techniques and practices of brewing that they were using when these styles were being invented are different than the ones that they are today. 
and again advances in technology help out with that you're not using a wooden fire under a giant pot with a bunch of monks that stir it around nowadays you know we have gas and stuff like that it changes some things uh, so if you want to use a 100% Vienna malt, boil it longer and get it into the right color range. Or decock it. That one actually too, doing a decoction mash will be, uh, will be massively delicious. And then you should also bring some in so we can taste it. I've uh, given this, uh, this one a couple different tries um, and it is a bit aggressive on the hop notes. Um, part of it also, uh, I think the hops might have been stored in the bottle for too long so i don't know if this is a recent one or if it's been sitting and we just got to it a little bit late um, but it is pretty aggressive it's on that new in the fridge new in the fridge it, to me it smells like old centennial when uh, old centennial starts to break down and it smells like uh, mr sketch purple smelly marker okay the one thing that i would say i mean i'm probably because i'm used to a lot of later edition hops too is it maybe just stagger out your hops a little bit more um, fermentation, I think, went a little bit wild on it. It's definitely a drinkable beer, but it's really, really aggressive for my morning palate. Speaking of morning Ooh, palate, wow. uh, mm. Patrick Sandy said, I bought you stuff. Thank you, Patrick Sandy. I appreciate you buying us stuff. Mm. And let us, uh, let, us, let us know if you want some stuff in return. Yeah, yeah definitely. You, we you really can message love that. me on the Discord. Yeah. Skyman 560. That'll take care of it. Yeah. Five, Skyman 567. Sour question. How much lime to add to uh, uh, sour? He's doing but, a 10 gallon batch, just so you are aware. Okay. okay. Planning on lime peels, direct the fermenter, or maybe tincture. Uh, I'm going to say be very, very. It, it's better in a sour because you're going to have the acid content. Be careful with lime, uh, especially the juice. But when lime ferments out in beers, it starts to taste like fruity pebbles. And it's no joke. I've done it several times, several different ways. Uh, if you cannot preserve the freshness of the lime oils, it's going to taste like fruity pebbles. That being said, lime peels, uh, to really get the oil on that. You need to get the beer. right lime peels, first of all. Yeah. Um, key limes work actually a little bit better. They're softer, a little bit sweeter. You want some uh, expression of oils, but you don't want it to be like, you know, super thick or super thin on the peels. Yeah. Uh, if you're peeling a lime and it burst oils everywhere, that's a good lime to use. Yeah. Uh, the super thin, thin skin, large limes are not going to give you very much, but the super thick wrinkly ones, uh, are a little bit more bitter on there. Um, but tincture is going to work out really well. That will help, uh, stabilize the oils and add them in. Plus uh, then you get to the use tequila, too. which makes everything better. And actually tequila would be amazing to do that with a little lime tequila sour. Oh, yes. Wow. Okay. So Avery did one of these and it was incredible. The Insula Misto Calibos. Oh my God. No, 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 no. Or was it the Fortuna? Fortuna. Okay. Insula uh, Melitas Calibos is a sour cherry. It's oh, bourbon gotcha. sour cherry. And I think I still have one of those. Ooh. Why uh, haven't you brought it in? Never mind. We we digress. Yeah. So <laughs> it kind of depends on that. Um, how much to add a, in there? It really depends on your beer. I would probably do it in post, just because you want all the acids to develop to know how your uh, lime's going to react mm. to it. Ah, uh, shit. It really yeah, it's knowing your uh, limes. F five five. Two pounds of limes, maybe. If I was going to say five for a five gallon batch, so that's like maybe ten. So yeah so I think someone commented the same thing and i was like yeah it's a good starting place but it really depends yeah combination of juice it's gonna i mean the juices change the acidity the peel has different oil content so it's really hard to like kind of nail down a number Ooh. but start with a little bit of juice and um, and more peel than you might think and then yeah you know if you need to add one or the other afterwards then yeah then do it uh also i have seen people use with really really great success and more uh excuse me, expression of lime is black limes. Ooh. If you can get a hold of those because they've already gone through kind of that degradation process, they've expressed their fruitiness. The oils change a little bit and that's really good as well. Uh, Jimmy J, have you tried raw versus white monk fruit? You got to be kind of careful with different monk fruits, uh, especially if they're not monk fruit extracts, because some of them have, you know, varying amounts of actual sugar in them. So it's kind of more of a guessing game, the less you know the composition. Um, so no, we haven't done that as a side by side experiment. But that's my only piece of advice if you do it. The monk fruit that we generally use is the monk fruit in the raw one. So yep. it's at URM. It's great. It's still keto. It's all monk fruit. Yeah. So. 
Uh, Adam mm. Schechter, English IP, uh, session IPA using Maris Otter and maybe Challenger and Target. Funny you should say that. <laughs> if you are somewhere in the Spokane area, you should go down to Natural 20 Brewing Company and have their Valley Cup brew. Because that was a session smash made with Maris Otter and Target. And I have not had it yet, but I'm actually really excited to go down and try it. Shall, shall we do some beer tasting afterwards? Do you need some pictures? Do uh, I do need some pictures? Yeah, we need to get some stuff done. Uh, we got, uh, yeah, we've got lots of fun videos and pictures okay. coming up. Follow Valley Cup on Instagram, by the way. I am one of the people running it, and so we'll make sure that there's some cool content on there that's specific, kind of the local Spokane scene. But if you're on the outside world and also want to see what's going on on that, then check it out. It's a whole new Instagram by itself. Yeah, I was gonna uh, say there's a lot of uh, stories for you to share. Yeah, yeah bro. because uh, cause, uh, me and Spokane. I shared I shared a b- chunk, bunch of years. I need to share uh, Spokane drinks. Is yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Oliver, we'll get uh, two more before we get on to topic one. Oliver George, hey guys, love your content. Wondering if you ever put black pepper in a session, and how did would you do it? We peppercorns. Brewed, we brewed a really good one, but the pepper doesn't show. Thanks. Uh, yeah, as Peter is saying, actually the whole peppercorns are a super duper light crack on them. Um, that way you get a slower extraction out of it. You're extracting less tannins. It's a lot easier for that. If you can find the actual like stick that the peppercorns are in, that's actually a really, really good way to do it. Um, if it's not expressing enough, you know you need to add more next time. Uh, also, if it's your first time or your first time doing it uh, with that particular style of beer, do your peppercorns in there immediately and then yeah i can't i'm sorry uh do your peppercorns in there for how much you think you should be doing in it if it's not expressing enough also have a side tincture made that you can come back and dose uh with that um did you already say playing around with a little bit of toasting on the peppercorns too oh god yes toast the pepper don't over toast them yeah no don't over toast but a light pan toast um not your cast iron because that should be well oiled and you want to keep it away from oils but a light pan toast is good uh, and then you just got to run it through a uh, tree with a bunch of branches and peppercorns on it. And then, you know, mm. you turn into a great mm. local brewer. Yeah. God, that sounds good. A light toast should be good. I mean, a light toast works with coriander actually really well, uh, too. A lot of that stuff. Just make sure you don't go over because you don't want to, you don't want to make tannins. You don't want to make the harsh, bitter flavors. Yeah, you're not They're making black. Really good and expressive in food, but in beer too much. But that should, if you're doing it with a new style and you think uh, you don't want to overshoot it, make a, tan, or a tincture on the side. That way you can uh, back those before package. Ooh, Mistral right. and Kalista hops, would they be good in a Session mm. IPA? If we have an answer to that, we should get to that because that kind of goes with it. But uh, Mistral and Kalista hops, yes, especially if you're trying to niche down into like an IPL style. Um, that said, I mean, if you wanted to, you'd have to add something to make it a good like session hazy or something like that, where you want all that fullness because uh, those can get easily lost by yeast expression and more full bodies. But if you went like IPL style, where you made it a little bit more grainy um, and it's crisp and light, then both the Mistral and the Kalista will taste really, really good. And there's a pop the orange. Or if you wanted to go into the orange that's in the Kalista, um, someone had a question about Voss too. What's the, yeah. uh, the best temperature for Voss to express that candy orange? And for me, it's been about 85. It's been really good. Mm-hmm. Definitely. There, God, people are getting some really good questions in here. I'm, I'm on this. Uh, Skyman fi- uh, 567 can't get his quite to drop clean even after two days at 34 cold crash. Gets better but not crystal clear. Uh, that could also be different processes than what you're doing for brewing. If you were putting in your hops anywhere in the late stage, dry hopping, that does build things that create stable haze in there. So you won't be able to get that out without something like Clarity Firm. If you're using a, a higher protein malt, which especially we're all going to be using pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, then that's going to create some protein hazes that uh, you either need to drop out in the hot break or cold break. Or again, use some clarifiers for. Uh, and I will actually say that most quikes are pretty stubbornly flocculent. Uh, most of it will, you will get to drop out a lot of the time without a really nice lagering session or without any uh, clarifiers. It's hard to get them to drop completely clean. So, yeah, that, there's, there's a mechanical breakdown process that can happen early on, but you might just kind of be SOL right now. Um, which is okay as long as the beer is tasting good. 
or if you want to buy a centrifuge, they're only about $50,000 and they do a great job clarifying your beer. Yeah, yeah. And then we're going to come over to your house and borrow it. Yes, we are. We're, uh, just, we're gonna buy it for us and then send us stuff. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know what I'd have to do for the, something like that. Mr. Boo Gang. Hey guys, Perth, Western Australia here. Howdy. Uh, I don't know much about Perth. My cousin lived there for a while. Howdy. And that was uh, that was pretty cool. Good day. <laughs> Good day. We're gonna piss no, off no, every no, Australian no, on the stream. <laughs> and I will say, I mean, I know it's pretty cliche to say, but uh, Aussie Man is one of my favorite entertainment sources. Like, I want to go to Perth just to accidentally run into him, and then make fun of people who fall. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> but his question: uh, Can you give me some secret tips about running a kegerator? My brews taste different from freshly poured to being in a corning keg. Thank you. Um, Secret tips to running a kegerator. Most kegerator companies are great at refrigeration. They don't know very much about beer. So you need to make sure that your kegerator has proper equipment and you need to make sure that it has proper line length in there and proper lines for that. Most of them do not come with that, which is why we love the Comos brand because they're good at beer and refrigeration. Yeah, you get forward sealing, stainless faucets right out the box. And so you're, you don't have to worry as much about cleaning because they come with poly lines, which are resistant to bacteria and flavor pickup. So your beer will stay high quality all the way through the keg. I mean, also make sure that you're good at re regularly cleaning your lines and cleaning your kegs really well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those are kind of, those are the, the pivot areas where having a good keg grader with, you know, things like those can help you, help you not experience those flavors, even if you're not the best at keeping everything maintained. So. Yeah. So uh, make sure your keg kegs are super clean to start out with. Make sure your lines mm -hmm. are super clean. Make sure you have the proper draw length to pressure on your kegerator, which means you're serving it at the proper pressure for that beer. And your line length is long enough to hold carbonation in that beer all the way through. Now, you also said something very interesting there, which was uh, from freshly poured to being in corny keg. And I'm kind of assuming what you're meaning is that the first pour tastes different than a month down the line. And that's just beer, it ages. No. Um, now, there could be some things that you're doing that's causing it to age faster or quicker. And it could be that you're also talking about that a couple days later, it tastes way different. If that's the case, woof, uh, you might be getting something somewhere in line. Yeah. But for that, to protect your beer and keg and make it taste longer, you need to make sure that you have a great process all the way down the line. And that means making sure all of your equipment's clean, making sure your keg is clean again. Transfers are low dough. Um, you, you're holding it under pressure. Your keg's at a low temperature in the kegerator. So I'm sorry to those of you who want to serve English style cask. Kegerators usually aren't designed to do that. Yeah. Um, you just try to put it at 36 or a really low temperature that's going to slow down any uh, aging that you use is unwelcome. And if you want yeah. more aging, just you know put your keg outside the kegerator. Yeah. So just make sure that you're make sure that your process is as best as it can possibly be and that will help preserve your beer all the way down the line make sure you're serving it at proper temperature <clears throat> and pressure and that should really help you out anything beyond that you're gonna have to get way more specific for us Ooh, uh, would be interested in more videos for inkbird smart including solenoid yeah. glycol chiller and coolbot hack did you watch the video where we made our own coolbot with an inkbird there's a video of, of well, logan yeah. doing that um, so if that's what you're talking about, then maybe. Um, yeah, uh, didn't he make a video of him building our glycol solenoid stuff? Yeah, that was the second video. So yeah. we had the, that video, and I think we made a video of the CoolBot hack. So instead of using a CoolBot, we spent like, you know, I don't know, $30 worth of stuff and bought an air, con air conditioner, so maybe $100 total, and did it for way less money. Yeah. And that's the, um, the definitely also on-site kick storage we have. Yeah. Uh, Pamela Hakla on the lime thing. Someone <coughs> said that uh, kaffir lime leaves are better for lime flavor, and I honestly might believe that because you're still picking up some of that green grassy bitterness. You're getting more lime yeah, oil expression um, and more of like probably the actual uh, like lime terpene oil expression rather than some of the other fruity. That could be really cool. Make one, Pamela, and send it to us or bring it. Yeah, we'd love to see you back here. Um, uh, K.O. Brewing uh, loves a little wheat in his IPAs, and that actually kind of yeah. goes into our topic number one a little bit. I don't know. We're, we might just keep answering questions because I think this is going really well. But uh, wheat this actually is good, is, is good yeah. in any session beers in general because it builds body and has character other than just base two-row character. And so it's going to 
automatically add a dimension in addition to some body in an otherwise relatively bodiless beer. Uh, I like it in IPAs too because wheat is actually very fruity and it has a little <clears throat> bit of an uh, acidic quality to it as well. So it really helps pop a lot more fruit flavors coming from uh, your hops. And at the same time, a lot of people think that uh, wheat is less fermentable than it is. And you can pretty much 100% ferment wheat out. Mm -hmm. It does have a higher protein content. Uh, but you can pretty much 100% ferment wheat out, so you can still get it into that locale area with some good uh, enzymes and rest and uh, enzymes. Yeah. I said it twice, and I know that. Enzymes and rest and enzymes. Um, also, we're drinking Matt slash Ned slash Guy in the Cheers beer, and it's pretty good. All right. so It, it actually didn't age terribly. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I can drink this. It's, it's got a distinct, this is still homebrew flavor, but it's, it's good. I can, I can, I can do it. Um, it's one of the recipes I need to work on a little bit. Need to get yeah. it, get it a little fixed. Uh, Steph uh, had a, a good question here. In your experience in using essential oils to enhance <laughs> aroma, and technically yes, because I would uh, count terpenes as an essential oil because that's pretty much what it is. Yeah. Uh, we have done a terpene series uh, in IPA before where we've taken isolated terpenes, uh, was it carophylline. Uh, myrcene, myrcene, um, terp, terpeno, terpen, terpeniol, terpeniol, yeah. um, and one more. And it was actually, I mean, it was awesome. That was super incredible. That was a fun experiment. Yeah. Uh, using some other essential oils, uh, we used a rosemary essential oil in something um, yep. before too. The regular essential oils that you can get, like the lemon balm and all the stuff that you can get from like, uh, uh, what's that? Dota, Dota, Dota box or something like that. Um, I wouldn't play around too much of those, first of all, just because their cost efficiency is low to mm -hmm. the flavor you get out of them. And some of them might be too potent in one direction. We found that out with certain oils that we've added where it just kind of distracted the beer and it didn't really add to the beer. So I'd be careful with it, but definitely possible. And I would put those two in terms of how you dose in kind of the same category. Uh, I would also say about essential oils is that essential oils tend to be very linear. Um, because they are extracting a singular essential oil or just one or two of the essential or of the oils that are in that thing. So using orange oil or orange extract really tends to be very big and bitter and you're kind of missing some of the round soft flavors that you are in oranges and can be, like Peter said, distracting on that. So, so instead, go into Abstracts Tech and buy terpene blends. I, in all honesty, if you want to get if you want to get a lavender uh, flavored something instead of a lavender essential oil, which will probably be soapy, go to the terpene labs, get the terpenes that are isolated in lavender, have them get a blend of that for you, and then use that, and you're going to get a bigger, rounder flavor. Yeah, we just gave you the biggest life half ever for IPAs. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, 77 Trans Am guy had a question back when we were talking about sweeteners uh, for things, talking about monk fruit, et cetera. Can you use a wine sweetener? The answer to that is usually, although uh, the wine sweetener is really meant to build body, uh, uh, body on a waterier, waterier base and actually add perceived sweetness as well. So I'm um, not 100% how it would work in beer. Um, and also it depends on the wine sweetener, but the answer is usually, but I can't 100% guarantee it. Do the experiment and send some to us. Yeah. Floater Joe. Oh, no, wait. Adam uh, uh, Schechter. Will do. Passing through in a few weeks. Uh, probably something else that uh, we commented on. Bringing you some Vienna lager, too. How nice. long is its lager long enough? Three weeks on already. Uh, three weeks for Vienna is probably long enough. And in all honesty... Uh, for anything, any aging, anything like that, there is no set standard. It's long enough when it's long enough. That basically means there's going to be a flavor peak in there somewhere. And once it starts hitting that flavor peak, anything beyond that is too long. Generally, that depends on the type of beer that you have a pretty good range that you can do. Vienna lagers, three to six weeks and lagering is generally about what you need for that. Um, most of the time beyond that doesn't help too much, but it could, depending on what you did with your beer. Bill Nova, beers at 9.30 a.m.? We yeah. can do that? Yeah, yes, you, you can. can. Yeah, hey, he's, I'm a guy right here. I he's, may not be the best life coach, 
but I will get you drunk. <laughs> He's from Yakima. That is the home of, ho I mean, Moxie Yakima. I know it's different, but for anybody outside of the area, pretty damn close. Yeah. And you are in the home of the hop, sir. Like, you have no excuse not to be doing market research at 830 in the morning besides, you know, <laughs> things to do with your life. Well, I, and I told him that 930 is late for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh this is a good one. Floater Joe, do you guys think a brewery could make it only producing smash beers? And for me, 100% yes, but also 100% no. It depends on where you are and if your local market can actually support something so specific. Uh, if you are in Portland, Seattle, San Diego, uh, with some of the big uh, San Francisco, you know, some of the say other... I even Spokane is starting to get to that point. We're, we can, we we are happen. maybe there. Spokane probably could support a smash but if you're in some of the big beer cities 100 if, if you're a good brewer so i will add uh, yeah. that caveat 100 if you're a good brewer people probably like most people will come in taste your beer be like wow this is really good beer and have no idea it's a smash yes so i think it's 100 percent possible if you're a good brewer if it's a marketing thing and you're not the best brewer and your beer is just kind of like there then probably not uh, maybe depends on your area because there's yeah. a lot of people like we could probably pull that off because there's a lot of people that come in here to experience new things and learn about pro products. Um, we could also probably pull it off because we're pretty good at brewing. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Fremont Brewing Company over in Seattle could start their own smash series, uh, Be smash brewery, brewery yeah. and pull it off because they do a wonderful job for that. Yeah, uh, Hub actually made it a big thing with their XPAs for a while. Yeah. Hub did a really good job with really just producing job. smash beers. The Amarillo XPA was so good. Yeah. Uh, yes, if you are good enough, you can make any style of brewery happen anywhere. Uh, if you are a good brewer, but not an absolutely phenomenal brewer, if your market can really support specialty breweries, then yes, I think it can, I can think it can happen really easily. The one deal about Smash and being a Smash specific brewery is you are really going to have to give up on a whole bunch of other styles, especially things like dark beers, because it's going to be real hard to make a Smash stout and only use something like carafa or roasted barley um you could do it there are ways you could do it especially through maillard reactions boiling uh condense yourself down enough to get uh, color and stuff like that but it, it would be a lot harder but you could patrick sandy pineapples dr pepper and a Royka pineapple dr pepper and a Royka cigar and genus live heck yes yeah sunday that sounds like a I don't know what an Eureka cigar is, but that still sounds pretty fun. Ah, uh, yeah. I know. Some of my favorite are the uh, acid cubas. When they yeah. dip them into the cognac, so you get that nice, fruity flavor on your lips. I know zero uh, about yeah. cigars, but they're fun to smoke, so. I, <laughs> I know zero, too. Most of the time, I will go into the cigar bar, order the uh, scotch or port that I want, and say, hey, give me a cigar for this, and just let the guy behind the counter do it for me. That's the way to go. Yeah, let the experts pick your stuff. Yeah. We don't need to be... We don't need to be knowledgeable on everything we do. Sometimes it's fun to let somebody else do it. Uh, Patrick Sandy. Here's a uh, nice one. Big fan of session beers. What are your thoughts <laughs> on, uh, of table beers? If we're going to break it down, they're the same thing, but only different. Yeah. Uh, all table beers are session beers, but I actually really love, love, love the idea of table beers. Yes. Uh, especially like the Belgian Teffel beer. For the entire country to be like, hey, sodas are bad for you, which they are, and I enjoy them a whole lot. But beer is less bad for you. But beer is kind of good for you so let's make a beer for school and they made teffel beer and it's amazing i absolutely love that i mean like hey guys let's make something that's good for our kids instead of poisoning <laughs> them with soda and go belgium, go belgium. Yeah. but we i a, love we, table we beer. went on a kick for a while with having a table beer on for uh, probably a, a, over a year straight I, we had different I, table I, beers on. i drank a lot of that yeah, yeah. those were those were those are nice to have on too for me i love them uh in the american market that's really hard just because a lot of american drinkers love to see if it's under five percent, it's a lot harder to sell that beer, no matter how good it is. Which yeah. is silly. Which is silly. Rahit Gund, what's the major difference between session and regular session IPA and regular IPA? Uh, fl basically, it's the alcohol percentage. So session is three to five percent. Uh, standard is five to seven point five, and double is seven point five to ten percent. But more specifically, um, session beer has to build body and flavor in different ways because alcohol actually carries some of the hop character in big IPAs that you're used to. And so session IPAs have to get a little creative building that in between character um, on a lighter body, but usually also a bodier that has fluff that doesn't come from flavorful areas. So 
Yeah. More, much more complicated than that. We did some conversation on it earlier, so. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll do our best. Patrick Sandy, didn't Dogfish Head make a sour with lime? I know the man in the chair answered. There's a couple of things uh, on this too. Skyman had something. Uh, it's their sequench ale, which is a black lime, uh, salted, sour. Um, it did Some sort of fancy wine. Yeah, it did it originally come out as a goza, and they changed it over to like a session sour, a salted sour. And I believe that has to do with, uh, uh, well, I don't know what it has to do with. But they are trying to make that beer not exactly a goza, but actually a healthy and a kind of refreshing beer. I know the salts in there is not just sodium salt. Uh, it has good electrolytes in it and stuff like that. It's that a, actually is an incredible beer to have after a workout. That it's will, a really nice beer in general to yeah, just drink. It, it's super delicious, but it, it, in all honesty, that is a good for you beer to have after a workout. So it's yeah. a cool thing. Uh, Jimmy J, could you use a wine fridge for a cask due to higher temperatures? Yes, you could. Um, to do a full cask program, it takes a little bit more um, ingenuity, uh, but yes, you could. Uh, we can talk about that next time you're in. There's there's a lot that I would love to do something similar to that, not necessarily with a wine fridge, but with a warmer temperature fridge and then and, uh, gravity. Yeah, uh, right <laughs> up there. Um, yeah. Logan, you were supposed to make that for us, so you need to come back and tree gnome it up. Yeah, everyone go comment on Logan's latest dorsal fishing video and yell at him for not building us a cask setup. Uh, yeah, do. I mean, go comment on his video because it's good and it's fun, especially if you like fish, but also so he'll come back and build us a cask thing. Yeah, it's important. Uh, Mr. Boogang. Love that name. That's pretty awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Appreciate it. Lines are clean and cleared. Kegerator set to negative one Celsius. Aussie Peppa Pig says hi. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's another comment down here below that. Are you for me 86? Uh, that seems a little bit cold. Um, if your beers actually, if you are finding your beers out of your kegerator, kegerator <clears throat> at negative one are a little less flavorful than you remember them being, do let them warm up a little bit. Uh, I mean, Okay, you are in a part of the world that is hot uh, quite often, so that could be the right temperature for you. But do keep in mind, when things are colder, you taste them less. That is a reason that big domestics want you to uh, serve their beers ice, ice cold. Ice, baby, cold. Because you can't cold, taste baby. it when it's ice cold. Once you can taste it, you realize it tastes like crap and you don't want it. Speaking Man, of that was harsh. Speaking but. of big domestic. Damascus. 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 People from Damascus. The, the 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 big dogs like this video. If you want to see us do a blind tasting of macro beers, all the big dogs that are out there, the yeah. biggest dogs, Great uh, Danes, Irish as, Wolfhounds, as many as we can find. And I I would even say that we could probably throw some uh, micro crispy boys in there too. Well, I was, gonna say, I was planning to do Something that. Like that. So that to little blind little eight oh five. Yeah, blindy on blindy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that is one thing. If you are drinking, if you are a fast beer drinker, you're finding you don't have as much flavor coming out of your beer. You have your kegerator set really low. Maybe take it up a few notches, or just let your beer warm up for a second. Yeah. Did you uh, do you get the really awesome fun fact from Nocturnal Brewer? Uh, I did. Uh, okay. Fine. Fine. <laughs> fine. Fun facts with Timothy. <laughs> There's your before uh, Nocturnal <laughs> Brewer says before the crowbar was invented. Crows simply drank at home. That I did, is a I fact. I did know that. I did know that one. That is a fact. Yeah. Crows are awesome. Like, crows are actually Ooh, shiny. awesome. They are so smart. And they murder people. I mean, they, they, they fight. They get into, they do get into, like, wars with uh, other animals. With other animals. With people, too. Yeah. They will harass you if you're mean to a crow. Yeah. Like, I love that. They have well, yeah, memory for life. Also, if you're nice to a crow and then they notice that someone's being mean to you, mm -hmm. they will actually go after that person. Yeah. Uh, we actually, there was an injured crow around our house once, and we put him in our backyard and gave him water. And legitimately, like... We had a bowl of water out for our dog at all times. And every year after that, there was always one or two crows hanging out in our back tree. And they'd come down and drink a little bit. And we're like, that's cool. You know, it's a safe place until my dog gets him. But, you know. On the other hand, though, I mean, crows have also started intergenerational warfare with other animals. Yeah. Like, that's other crows in their herd, or whatever you call it, in their murder. murder of crows, like, know from birth that they need to hate, hate this animal. This animal. <laughs> I love it. I, oh, those are intelligent creatures. Anyway, yeah. Funky Brewer, what's your process for back sweetening beer with simple sugar, such as honey or maple syrup? Do you add anything to stop fermentation with the addition, or just cake it up? 
When, if, if I ever came to that, I'd probably try to like super fine filter it. So go from 10 micron all the way down and subsequent to like a 1 or a 0.5 micron, uh, which is a painful process and you need to be very careful that everything is low dough. But that should, 0.5 micron should clear out all, um, all the yeast and so you'll be good to go. Back sweetening into a keg. Yeah. Low dough. Low dough. Uh, it, uh, theoretically, if you keep your keg at super low temperatures, like 34 below, uh, and you're using an ale yeast, it shouldn't ferment, but... If you drink it fast enough. It probably still will and create some problems. Uh, if you want to go a little bit easier route, of course, you can kill off the yeast either through pasteurization, which... If you're not careful with that, you can heat the yeast too far and burst their cells open and create uh, autolysis. You could do it through a chemical process of uh, sulfites or sorbates. Uh, personally, I would prefer a sorbate over a sulfite. Don't want uh, farty smells in the beer. Yeah. Um, just unfortunately, that's a really, really hard thing to do. The other thing that you could do with it, if it's a beer that is structured for it, if you age it long enough, the yeast will hibernate and die out. Uh, so that way, when you back sweeten it, it probably won't kick back up and ferment that. Depending so, on if you're really good at making sure there's zero chance of infections anywhere. So, Or you can go the super easy route and just put a little of that simple syrup, syrup in your glass. That's also something you could do. Try it that way. Yeah, yeah. George uh, Hawkins, hey, yeah. from the UK. Hi, from uh, Spokane, Washington. How best to minimize oxidation when adding gelatin to keg or fermenter? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, if, I would add it to the keg specifically, and then I would use a syringe. So I would do the whole gelatin heated up thing. I would use a syringe. I would super CO2 uh, gas out disconnect. Um, and then with that gas out disconnect, I would add a small length of tube to it. I would relieve pressure a little bit through that gas out disconnect, have some sort of an on-off valve on there, pop the syringe on, squeeze, squirt it in. Um, you should be making the gelatin with boiled and cooled water. So the risk of oxidation actually mm. physically dissolved in that water is very minimal. Um, so yeah, that's the best way to low. And then add some ascorbs in it just because. Ascorbs. Just add some ascorbs. Greg H, thoughts on rye to add body to session ales? Um, rye is super aggressive. Yeah. Uh, so rye itself, the actual rye malt, I'd say mm -hmm. you probably have to add too much in there. It would be too far aggressive for a session ale to make that big of a difference. Uh, flaked rye, you could probably get to a good point that you it would be a nice bodybuilder, but that's going to be very aggressive. So do keep that in mind. Rice. George, rice what part of the UK are you from? Just curious. Yeah. AKA, what beer can you, <laughs> can you send what us? What beer can you send us? Uh, uh, did you do uh, Jimmy J? I just used 20% of wheat in my pale ale. I brewed with Omega Tropical IPA to somewhat counter the high attenuation and provide a touch of residual body. Matt can let you know if it worked out or not. Matt, did it work out? I think so. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nocturnal Brewer, how big is your recipe book now? Uh, it, actually, we do keep track of it. If anybody wants to go see any of our recipes, it is on Brewer's Friend. Just look up Genus on that. You can look at all of them. I think we're over 600 recipes on there. I, this is also considering I go through and mass delete like recipes that are like redundant or stupid or um, you know, because we also don't we we get recipes from other people and put them in so we can build them up for people. So somebody will bring us a book and be like, hey, can you turn this into a recipe? And I'm like, all right, retype up the recipe, bring it all out. We've probably made in our tenure here. I don't know, between four and 5,000 recipes. Currently, right. you're seeing at 871 recipes. Oh, okay. Currently online is 871. 871 recipes. And that's not including the recipes that are on Logan's account that he bought a lifetime subscription for. But I think there's probably like another three or 400 on there. There probably are. It's, uh, and you know, <laughs> keep in mind, like Peter said, that's not all us writing those recipes. Sometimes people are doing them. Other times people are like, hey, I want to clone this beer. So we'll find uh, somebody that has a recipe that we like, pull it in, uh, finesse it out into what it actually should be. Uh, I know the Wisconsin person uh, just mentioned, or they mentioned Spotted Cow earlier. I actually have the recipe for Spotted Cow. Um, I, I don't know what it's called in ours, but if you want the recipe for Spotted Cow, if you look up in our genus book, it's very Splotchy obvious. Splotchy bovine or something like that? Yeah, it's very obvious. <laughs> it's very obvious. Uh, you know, this is like, Dalmatian heifer or something like that. I don't know. Um, 
but it's in there. Uh, so there are some times that we do that. One of our local places wanted a, a tavern beer like that. Or we'll take, you know, like Spotted Cow. Those guys that uh, wanted the tavern beer like Spotted Cow, but more Northwesty. I took Spotted Cow, and instead of using the uh, traditional hops for it, I used traditional Northwest hops like Cascade, Mount Hood, and Willamette. It is spot- Pamela Hockless at Bingo. Clown. Spotted Clown. Spotted Clown. Nice. Yeah. Oh. Is that the only one in there? Because I'm, I thought they, I'm pretty sure that there might be a few of them. No, no. There's so. there's also a, an extract version of the spotted uh, uh, spotted clown clone two large spotted clown. Oh yeah, so that's it. Yeah. So you know, um, yeah, that's what we do. So Pamela got a bingo. How nice. do you pre- how do you present your bingo card? Uh, message me a <laughs> screenshot on Discord. <laughs> And then come in, and we'll give you a solid high five. Yes, and a beer. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's actually a really good one. We answered Oliver's already uh, in there. Matt. Matt. Uh, for Graf. Kaisan. For Graf. Marisader, Cara Amber, and Cara Munich. I, like, I actually, like, really I'm hmm. kind of enjoying that. Some nice sweetness. It depends there on the apples ye- you're yeah, using I was going to say some yeast finesse, too. I imagine you want to back sweeten with a certain amount of apples, too. Yeah. Well, the yeast, the di- what I'm Coffee imagining crisps. right now, um, I want something deep, dark, and red. I want this beer to almost taste like toasted Red Delicious. Yeah, you'd have to concentrate some stuff down because Red Delicious is mostly like fermented Red Delicious isn't that delicious. It's, no, it's not. It's well, all, it's all water. Okay, if you have Spire Dark and Dry, the way that Spire Dark and Dry is has that those deep notes and it oh, it tastes like kind of that perfect tasting red delicious skin. Yeah, I love that. I would also say mm-hmm. in here, Matt. My thoughts, my initial uh, thought for that is adding some molasses. Yeah, something like really, really depth in it. Um, yeah. And but I think you might have to back sweeten honestly if you want some extra mm, to go. Well, so just to build off the malts because it can be a little bit disjointed if it's like dry parts of the cider and then sweet parts of the malt. So I think a little bit of actual apple sweetness in the end of it would mm-hmm. help. But. Or uh, Mayard some apple juice, boil down some apple juice, make some apple molasses and then yeah. blend that in. That could be amazing. That would be the winner. And use Brett. Ah, Brett C. Yeah. Brett C. Get some funky pineapple. Or Brett B. Guys, the Hazy mm. IPA I was sending you will be 6%, was supposed to be 7-ish. I used my typical 1.5 quarts of water per pound of grain. I think moving to two quarts per pan will help uh, with conversion on hazies. Uh, it might, yeah, just because if you're getting a lot of, uh, I mean, also Visco Buster, but if you're getting a lot of beta glucan gums that are making it so your flowability is down because the um, uh, adjunct proportion is so high, then I could see going up just for floating floating it. Um, again, more for, so for vertical systems. So if you're in like a coffee can all in one, like uh, Anvil Foundry or Bruzilla or something like that, then I could see that being better. But also enzymes but yeah visco buster enzymes it enzymes it uh right above that uh no mm, matt this actually really did taste it, it aged well i like that yeah uh, do you guys ever play around with making na beer um no we actually really haven't the deal with that it is it is very cost prohibitive uh the yeast the easy yeast to make na beer are very expensive, especially for small uh, brewers to use. It really hasn't broken out into the homebrew scene yet. Uh, the equipment to make any beers out of alcoholic beers is far too expensive for us to afford. Yeah, the chemical processes. So, we will once it becomes viable for us to do that. Uh, and most of the time, even though we could order in a big, big brick and start making some NA beers, we don't experiment around with a whole lot of new stuff until it com- becomes available for the homebrew market. That way we can relate it to you and be able to get it into your guys' hands. Um, Daniel Cunningham, uh, mash efficiency when using a 20 to 25% wheat ends up much lower than other beers. Uh, usually 70 percent rather than the 85 fly sparging using around igloo coolers under crushed wheat probably not uh, i would refer back to the same answer we had for adam chumbly where mm-hmm. visco buster would be my number one thing what's probably happening is beta glucan gums are preventing flowability through your mash so that's basically something that water doesn't like to go through um, instead of sugars that water absorbs as it goes through you've got these little gums that water goes around and those gums hide sugar pockets 
which is the missing sugar in your beer. So a Visco Buster will help with that or doing a rest um, somewhere in the 125 range for 20 minutes will uh, also help. Rice holes. Rice holes, yeah. A lot of rice holes. Fluff it. Yeah. Uh, that's just one thing. There's no holes on that. Uh, they do have a much, much, much lower Gracias. diastatic power. Mm, Gracias. They have a much more uh, lower diastatic power uh, than any other barley malt really does on that. So the mm. enzymes are really going to help them out. Uh, if you're really struggling with that too, maybe doing a little bit of an extra long mash. You know, hit all the steps. Hit all the steps. Michael Lane, use under uh, use Mecca uh, grade under modified Pilsner malt yesterday for my triple L. Cool. You did a proper mm. mass schedule. Correct. Um, so much protein in my foundry. Also correct. Uh, hopefully you had a good way to get that out and didn't didn't burn some to your foundry. But uh, yeah, that's uh, under modified malts are fun until they're not. Yeah. Yeah, they're a uh, little bit. They're, they're always fun to see how much protein ends up with those. Even that, even if you use like a high uh, grist ratio, and if you do that in a hazy IPA between the hop shrub and all the extra proteins, it is a lot. It is a lot. Uh, I mean, they're great things, especially when using stuff like bread or other bacteria. Uh, I would always 100% recommend some other modified stuff. Just get those extra proteins in there. Let Brett eat everything. Yeah. But uh, at, at after a certain point, all the extra work is just extra work. George Hawkins is from about an hour south of Burton on Trent. Mm, yes. Mm, so send us every beer around you that you can get your hands on. And I will tell you, I know, we'll I know, <laughs> well, I know it's a, a lower, less thought of beer because it's one of the more mass produced ones, but I will tell you some London pride literally got me into uh craft beer fuller still does a full like party guile uh brew on that one and i enjoy it so i would also take that one also for ascorbs we have a whole video on ascorbs when i say ascorbs i'm talking about ascorbic acid um so mm -hmm. if you want to learn more about that check out our ascorbic acid video yeah uh, Patrick Sandy, any beer styles you would not make a session version of, excluding the big ones like Russian Imperial Stout and such? Um, I don't think that there's really any style that couldn't be sessioned well as long as you're doing it right. I do yeah. a session stout that you guys have had. The, yeah. the salted caramel stout yeah. I do. Well, we made a summer stout um, that was only 5% that was absolutely phenomenal. That sold really that. well for a dark beer for us, too. Yeah. Um, you should rebrew it. There's <laughs> that sounds wrong. Yeah. Well, we'll do something similar. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. <laughs> anyway, something similar, yeah. Yeah, there's a few of them. I mean, I, in all honesty, I think it would be pretty fun to see if you could make a session barley wine too, and just Maillard the shit out of a beer. Uh, tons and tons and tons of boiled Maillard character going into that, but only have it five percent. And barrel age really it so you fun. can get the yeah. same big booziness. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I have had a, a barrel-aged beer that was only like 5%. It was really good. <clears throat> and a quick follow-up. He goes, what styles do you think would be our kind of more ideal for making session? Um, I, I mean, all of them, honestly. Yeah. Uh, the obvious ones to me are like mixed from sours and things that have oh, yeah. a lot of character naturally. Um, Yeast-derived yeah, beers. Yeah, any beer that has really, really big yeast character makes it it's a no-brainer for session styles. They're also really good on big beers. They're just more difficult to deal with. But Yeah, I mean, Grisette. Grisette is just one about the tastiest beers you can make, and it's not, but it's basically a session saison. Um, absolutely wonderful. And most sours, most mixed firm sours are not that alcoholic. A lot of them could be in the session range, especially traditional ones. Uh, that one. In this one yeah um you know and, and that ends up happening just because fermentation in mixed firm beers there are things that can eat alcohol and turn it into acid i think that's just a standard just american stout yeah. just a standard american stout yeah. Yeah. it's good from from talking to him on one of his live streams oh dope. yeah but uh, yeah yeah um, is that steel chair that's a that's steel chair yeah that's cool. SC is cool. steel, yeah se is Definitely um, still share. So Cole, I'd say, if you're watching, yeah. Thanks I'm for the beer. I'm assuming that's at least that's what I'm assuming. I would also say for uh, styles that lend themselves well to sessions is a whole bunch of uh, English, Irish, and Scottish styles. Naturally, pub beers are session beers. Yeah. You know. So there you go. I Mild ale. That's a perfect session beer. ESB. 
or bitters like that's a perfect session beer in there most of the reds for it like yeah there you yep. go so all right uh da, 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 da. you know i mentioned in previous live streams that optimash was better for hazies uh, we we've used optimash we use viscobuster and optimash for pretty much everything yeah um so i wouldn't say it's necessarily better for hazy it's just it helps us keep our consistency there and so, then we can do more extreme grist things so which would you use on a hazy optimash or viscobuster both or both both okay 100 percent both yeah viscobuster uh, takes care of the beta glucans yeah and optimash just helps convert everything so on hazies, especially because uh, you're using such a high adjunct quality on hazies, OptiMash is amazing because it really helps you maximize all of those sugars that are coming out from the flaked grains, the oats, the wheat, the rice, whatever other adjunct fluff haze you're adding in there. OptiMash is going to be amazing because again, some of those don't have enzymes and others have very low amounts of enzymes so anything you can do to help it out to fully convert and create consistent beer we're always going to recommend optimash so it creates consistency more than anything and that way you can play more with malts and hops rather than relying on uh oh i hope i have enough enzymes to make this work yeah there's a lot of good comments on you know new technologies that have come out in the non-alcohol beer world. Uh, leave us a comment if you'd like us to make a whole video on all the new technologies in the non-alcoholic world. Um, and there, I there's can just probably a, help get some of the non-alcoholic beers to per try. Perfect. Yeah, yeah that'd be that, that's that's a deep dive. We we're already getting into some deep dive Smith. stuff in the comments. So yeah, Maddie Smith, uh, I knew at one time was going to work for Athletic, so we might be able to get some stuff from him. I've, I've had Athletic. Uh, Humble Abode has. The, uh, their stuff in nice. Rachel. Nice. Rachel used to be yeah. a uh, brand ambassador for them. Why don't you get uh, Rachel TT's Rachel on oh, nice. um, a live stream? Yeah. yeah. I was gonna say uh, uh, I, I will add her to the the massive list. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> DFDS Art Session Pills is a little bit of an oxymoron because session be uh, uh, this is one of those things that especially in the united states is a little bit harder than in a lot of the european states to look at session beers are defined as they being things under five percent most traditional pilsners bavarian or czech should be under five percent so they're already going to be a session beer um, pilsner helles lager those are perfect examples for session beers too Again, being in the United States, it's kind of, it, it, for some places, it's actually getting much, much better, much easier to sell beers of any kind, but it is hard to sell beers under 5%. So that's why you see a lot of American Pilsners being over 5%. They necessarily shouldn't be, but unfortunately to make money off of them, it's, it, you kind of got to do things like that. Make a little concessions, right? But yeah, Pilsner. Make a session Pilsner. That would be absolutely delicious and phenomenal. And Fun. send us some. Yeah. yeah, and send it to us. Uh, yeah, so uh, we we never really kind of got a too, too topic one, but we talked a lot about topic one and how to make your session beers taste good uh, and everything. Um, you know, and that uh, if we got With some... With your questions, I think we did a pretty good job. Yeah. So let's start working on closing out. We are technically open right now, so... Oh, and I need to get my wife her keys because yeah. I accidentally took them to work today. Like this video, comment on this video, uh, check out our Amazon thing if you want to buy us something. And we've got a whole list of things that would support us and help us out, ranging from you know necessities like batteries to things that are definitely not ridiculous in the slightest. And if you do, we'll do something in return, like make you a video, give you a shout out, um, come film your daughter's wedding or a commercial for your business, whatever. I was gonna say that if you get the chair, if you get the chair, Matt, Matt will, will be happy. Very Matt, right, Matt you, will be very happy. Matt will do all your homework for a year. Yeah. So uh, you, yeah. You, you expect I did my own homework when well, I was in college? Uh, we'll get going. We got some good questions on that. We'll try and get uh, the other videos that you guys are uh, were requesting on it. Thank you for tuning in, Jimmy J. I have no idea what Utah Brewers actually do for that. Um, so. Call. I think the laws have changed oh, too. Uh, I will what? I think the alcohol laws in Utah have changed as well. Some of them. Yeah. It's still pretty independent county by county. It's in interesting. Uh, but yeah, thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, go follow all of our stuffs. Definitely vote for us in the Valley Beer Cup because we have the best beer out there. And uh, we'll see you next time, next Sunday, right here. <laughs>